welcome to Rethink Your Drink, getting safe and drinking water, getting safe app and drinking water in schools and community places. My name is Holly Calhoun, and along with my colleague, Katie Maumann, we'll be running today's webinar. We've got a great agenda lined up for today, but before we get started, I want to take a moment to go over a few housekeeping items. We are recording today's webinar and we'll post the recording and presentation slides on our website at phasocal.org, Rethink Your Drink. If you have, uh, please share the link with interested colleagues who are unable to join today. Audio is through your computer speakers and headset or through your telephone. Everyone has joined the webinar in listen-only mode, which means that your audio lines are muted. We encourage you to ask questions throughout today's presentation. You can do so at any time via the question panel. We will address questions for the panelists during a brief Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Q&A will be followed by an interactive discussion and we want to hear from you. At that time, Katie will cue you to use the raise hand feature. Click on the hand icon and we will take you off of mute to join the discussion. One of our main goals in this series is to investigate the question of how can we, as public health and nutrition leaders, best engage the serious water issues facing our health and nutrition leaders, uh, facing our state, and our webinar series will include where possible opportunities for us to come together as a community to explore. We really hope you will share your questions, thoughts, and ideas on the topic. And finally, if you experience any technical difficulties, you can either send a question to one of our staff or call GoToWebinar at 855-352-9002. And now I'd like to turn it over to the co-chairs of the Healthy Food Systems Working Group, Naomi Billups, um, Public Health Nutrition Manager at the County of San Diego, and Gail Hoxter uh, with the Public Health Nutrition Services and Health Promotion Branch at the County of Riverside Department of Public Health. Gail? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Holly. Good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to have a group on with us today to learn exciting things about water and where we're going this year and years to come. And you have two uh, co-chairs for the Healthy Food Systems. We are one of the subgroups of the Southern California Public Health Alliance, which has uh, a, a large group of following up, uh, throughout the region and with that the Public Health Alliance vision is that all Southern California communities are healthy, vibrant, and sustainable places to live, work, and play. And you can see in the orange block exactly which local health departments are involved in the Southern California Public Health Alliance. And believe it or not, we represent 60% of the California population. So yes, we really do make a difference when you're looking at the state of California. But with that, uh, we are excited because there are multiple uh, work groups that are within the uh, alliance and healthy food systems is one and we've worked on multiple things in the past. You can go to our website and see what we have done from a procurement standpoint. Uh, you can look at what we did last year on working with environmental health and partnering together uh, from that aspect and then uh, this year we're introducing our webinar series Drought climate and food we eat, safeguarding nutrition and food security in dry times. So this is really crucial as you can tell the water is a hot topic in the state of California and, and the uh, western region. So with that I'm excited to introduce uh, the people that really make this happen and that is uh, Tracy Delaney as our executive director and she's just fabulous and she's always putting uh, our alliance at the state level and, and national level. So uh, Tracy is definitely um, someone who is so very important. And Carla Blackmar is uh, our project manager and she's been with us ever since the beginning and just a fabulous support. And Katie Maumann is our water initiative coordinator and talk about an expert on water, Katie is it. And Holly Calhoun comes to us from the Healthy Food Systems Coordinator, and Holly is is a friend from uh, the Food Policy Councils in that aspect. So 
the staff are fabulous and are here to serve the Alliance and really uh, help us make a difference. So with that, we want to for us. And w so we can learn more as to who is on the call. Uh, let's do this quick poll so, our, uh, our poll so that our uh, organizers and panelists know who's on the call. So select if you are from Agriculture, Food Policy Council or Alliance and Collaborative, Public Health Nutrition, other governmental, uh, please type into the chat box which you are from, or other non-governmental uh, uh, organizations. So let's take a minute and vote. So it looks like we have a really good turnout. We have 5% uh, from the Food Policy Council Alliance and Collaborative and 67% from Public Health Nutrition, 14% from other governmental agencies, and 14% from non-governmental agencies. So that is our, our group today for our panelists and organizers. We're, I think we're ready to go. Okay, great. Thank you, Gail. This is Naomi Billups. I'm the Public Health Nutrition Manager and co-chair with Gail um, of the sub-work group. Um, I wanted just to put out there before I introduce the speakers that as you're listening to our wonderful series that has been put together, um, sort of taking away the things that you're already doing in your respective jurisdictions and then also, you know, possibilities that could come up and we'll get to that in the question and answers. But without further ado, I would like to th say thank you very much to both of our speakers today um, for taking their time out and um, really truly giving some expertise to the, um, to the webinar. So our first panelist, next slide. is Dr. Anisha Patel. She's an assistant professor for the University of California, San Francisco. She completed her medical degree at the University of North Carolina, residency at Stanford, and a fellowship at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, she has uh, conducted research in the areas of chronic disease prevention with an emphasis on encouraging healthy beverage consumption among children and adolescents in school and child care settings. She received funding for her research from foundations and the National Institutes of Health and published numerous peer-reviewed manuscripts in this area. Dr. Patel also received the American Academy of Pediatrics Outstanding Achievement Award for her work to translate research into policy. Thank you, Dr. Anisha Patel. Great, thanks everyone for taking time um, from your busy afternoons to join us here today. So um, today I'll be speaking with you about um, efforts to increase water intake among children in community settings. So first I'll be speaking with you all about the importance of promoting water intake, the current status of water access in school and community settings, some current community-based efforts to increase water intake, and then some strategies you can take to your local communities to improve water intake among the populations you serve. So many of you, um, given the poll um, results, um, a lot of you working in public health nutrition or in food or even in governmental organizations. And so many of this um, information, probably much of this is already um, old news. But just to reiterate the importance of why we want to promote water intake, um, as you all know, um, drinking water as a replacement for sugary beverages can help reduce caloric intake and therefore prevent um, obesity as well as dental caries. 
Um, in addition, um, there are some studies that suggest that maintaining appropriate hydration, especially among students in school settings, may improve their cognitive function and their ability to learn in schools. Um, and there's recent research that suggests that children may not be meeting their total water requirements. Um, there's a study that was done in Los Angeles and New York where they um, examined children's urine osmolality, which is a marker of their hydration status. And they found that two in three children actually come to school with elevated urine osmolality, um, further um, you know, suggesting that it's important to promote water intake. So schools are an important venue for improving water access because children spend so much time in the school setting. Um, in addition, water access in school food service areas is actually required by law. Um, this is um, secondary to state legislation, California Senate Bill 1413, and also federally as a part of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010. So what does water access look like in U.S. schools? Um, currently, water access is actually not a part of the lunch tray. If you go to most schools and visit, you'll see chocolate milk um, and juice, but not as much water on the tray. Um, if students want water in schools, the most common source is through a drinking fountain, and in some schools, um, students may also be able to purchase bottled water. So we've conducted um, surveys of California school administrators. Um, this study in this slide, it comes from 2010 to 2011, and it shows the percentage of schools that reported offering at least one water source um, in different areas of the school. So what you can see here is with regard to the outdoor and exercise areas that students are active in, about one in five students um, didn't have access to water in those areas. And in the food service area, um, this was before legislation passed, one in um, four students didn't have access. And then you can see it's even lower for the classroom setting and these temporary structures that are often built um, to accommodate additional students on school campuses. So when we've gone out and actually observed students drinking water at lunchtime, we found that very few students actually drink the water. Um, between 1 and 11 percent of students in the schools we observed, um, we observed 24 schools um, in the Northern California. And what you can see in addition to that is in this slide in the blue are when water was provided via a traditional drinking fountain. And then the white is when water was provided through a non-fountain source, which was either a dispenser or a cooler or something a little more um, appealing for the students. And you can see that providing that non-fountain source did bump up the percentage of students who consumed water. So why are students not drinking um, water? One possible explanation is that fountains may not appeal to students, and these are actual pictures that we've taken from some of the schools we've visited. So when we asked um, students, and these students are from Los Angeles Unified School District, about what they thought about drinking fountains, many of them had negative attitudes about the drinking fountains, um, that the fountains were dirty, that the water didn't taste good, or even that the water contained chemicals that could make them sick. So the question then is, how do we get from letter of the law? So a school administrator, may, administrator, when we ask them, do you have water available on your campus, they'll say yes. But a lot of times when we visit, there may be mops or napkins or poorly maintained fountains. How do we get from that to option B, where it's a more appealing access point for students? So we conducted a project in um, actually Northern California near San Francisco, where we um, had an intervention that we developed that included environment change and some minimal promotion to see if we could improve water intake as compared to traditional drinking fountains. And what we did was we first tested the water for lead, and if there was a problem with lead, then we remediated the water supply to remove that contaminant. Um, and then we also tested out to see two different delivery systems. So one included a bottleless cooler, which is on the top there. You can see it's a box unit that students can go and fill up a cup of water. And then in the bottom, um, we worked with the food service staff to fill up these um, dispensers with cold water, and we provided cups in all the locations along with some simple promotion and signage. So what we found in the study, um, this shows the percentage of students who reported drinking more than a few sips of water at lunch. Um, and pre is the lighter blue, that's before we started the project. And then post is the darker blue, it's after the project was over. And you can see that in the schools that had the little dispensers, um, the uh, percentage of students who reported drinking water went up um, by about 20%. Um, a little less in the cooler schools and in the control schools, it stayed the same as we would anticipate. 
So what about child care? I've talked a lot about schools. So child care is another important location where students are spending lots of time and we have a chance to really influence early um, dietary patterns. So this is um, data that comes from a study conducted by um, Lorene Ritchie, who's at Nutrition Policy Institute, and some colleagues, and they um, looked at implementation of the current um, standards that require that water be available in child care facilities that are licensed. And the requirements are um, that they be available um, throughout the day, including at meals and snacks and outdoors. And so in 2008, um, that's the lighter blue, that's before the implementation of the law, and then 2012 is a year after implementation. And what you can see here is that for meals and snacks, um, the percentage of child care facilities that reported water access um, went up, and then in um, the outdoor areas, it also went up, and these are both statistically significant changes. So um, again, when you ask the child care providers, they may say, yes, definitely there's water available, but it may look like the pictures on the left, and these are pictures we took from observations and visits to child care facilities. So not the greatest access. Students would have to ask a grown-up for water, ask for a cup, et cetera. Versus on the right are examples of um, greater implementation um, where we have um, cups and reusable water bottles that are at child height so they can go get water whenever they want. Um, in addition, we have mealtime water access um, alongside milk um, in a family style pattern. So what about other community locations? So there's not as much data on community-wide efforts. Um, there was a national study of U.S. parks that estimated that about 55% of U.S. parks have access to drinking fountains. This was based on um, reports of visitors to parks. And um, when we conducted some qualitative research with park users to understand barriers to access, um, we've heard that um, the fountains may be vandalized in those locations. There may be weather damage to the fountains by animals. Um, people don't feel comfortable drinking when the animals are using the same water source, or there may be just a lack of maintenance. So now I'd like to move on to talk a little bit about the Agua for All pilot, and Laurel Firestone um, will tell you more about this project um, in a minute as well. But Agua for All is taking place in two um, main regions of California, including um, the Central Valley in South Kern and then Eastern Coachella Valley. Um, and the goal of this project, which is funded by the California Endowment, is to raise awareness of the lack of safe um, drinking water. These communities are plagued by um, contaminants in the drinking water. Even though we're in the U.S., these areas still um, have unsafe drinking water with contaminants such as nitrates and arsenic. And so the goal is to promote safe water through the installation of reusable water bottle filling units that um, actually dispense filtered water that is free of contaminants. Um, so our goal now is to work in conjunction with the partners with the Agua for All pilot, which is the California Endowment, Rural Community Assistance Corporation, Community Water Center, and El Pueblo Unido to help evaluate the program. So what will this project look like? Um, so we have two groups of um, communities that we're working with right now for the evaluation. They're both located in South Kern. Um, one of the communities will be an intervention group and the other will be a control group. And both the intervention and the control group, group will receive installation of these reusable water bottle filling stations that dispense safe water. However, um, one of the communities will receive added promotion, which will include a promotional toolkit um, that's available in English and Spanish, technical assistance um, by some um, researchers and community partners, and then a very small stipend to develop their site-specific um, promotional activities. And then um, what we plan to do is collect data um, before installation of the TAPS, um, after installation of the TAPS, but before promotion, and then after the promotion. And the goal is to document um, water use and the volume of water taken from water sources. So that we do by observing the percentage of individuals who are using the water stations and also tracking the volume of water that's taken from the water sources. Um, in addition to that, we're going to also be conducting some qualitative research, interviews, and focus groups with patrons at the either high and low water use intervention sites to understand some of the barriers and facilitators to this project. So we have collected some baseline data um, in South Kern, and this is um, data that actually we've analyzed from South Kern right now. Um, this shows in the school setting. So there are currently four um, schools in the South Kern area that we are evaluating. There are additional schools that are not in the evaluation um, framework, however. 
Um, and this shows the percentage of students who we observed to actually consume water at recess and lunch. So the darker blue is recess and the lighter blue is lunch. And what I'd like to point out is lunch first. Um, so lunch is the lighter blue. And you can see in the K through six um, grades, 4% um, of students actually were observed drinking the water at the lunchtime period, whereas in pre-K, 0%. And we, um, that reason for that is in pre-K, there was no water offered at the table for mealtimes, and so students really didn't have access to any water, whereas in K through 6, there's typically a water fountain um, located somewhere near the um, school cafeteria where students could get that if they wanted to. However, I will say that it was limited in terms of their ability to move around at lunch. Um, we also observed recess um, water consumption, and what we saw was in pre-K and KG, um, the pretty high percentage of, this, of students that actually were observed drinking the water. And this was um, related to the fact that in those locations, um, students were um, provided with a break where they were told to line up and get water before going inside. Whereas in the older grades, um, students weren't really instructed to get water, and they were allowed to play and get water um, at their own will. So this shows in the community sites. So in addition to schools and the Agua for All project, there will also be community sites that will be receiving these reusable water bottle filling stations. Um, and the community sites include um, WIC clinics, um, regular health clinics, family resource centers, parks, and libraries, um, in addition to some other um, locations that are in our evaluation framework. So you can see here, again, the percentage of site users we observed um, drinking water at baseline before the taps go in. You could see in WIC and the Family Resource Center, it was 0%. And that was because the water that was available was primarily for staff, so people couldn't really get the water unless they asked. Um, and then in park, health clinic, and library areas, um, it ranged from 8 to 14% site users that could access the water. So um, how do you um, meet the spirit of the law in your own local community? So these are some quick tips on um, lessons learned from our research and work in community um, locations. So one is to make sure you provide not only appealing water, but also water that's safe and make sure that it's in a location that's for, of high traffic um, for site users. Um, it's also important to make sure that individuals have a means for taking more than a sip of water. So um, providing cups is an option or creating a culture in these locations where reusable water bottles are used on a regular basis and brought in. Um, it's also important to not only um, provide the safe water and the appealing water, but also to promote it. Um, so whether that includes um, providing results of their testing so individuals can see this water safe or even um, just information about why drinking water um, could be healthy for you. Um, and lastly, it's important to build a water access legacy. Um, so a will come and go in a lot of these locations, um, and it's important to ensure that your efforts remain um, throughout um, the years. And so that can be formalized through a water policy um, that's written into either a school district wellness policy or a site, site wellness policy. So there are some educational resources and toolkits out there, but um, given that I'm running short on time, I think I'll leave those um, for later in the question and answer period if anybody has questions. Otherwise, you'll re receive a resource packet, which will list all of these as well. I'd like to um, acknowledge all of our funders and the many collaborators, volunteers on all the projects we've mentioned today. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. That was that was wonderful. Um, I just before I uh, introduce our next next speaker, I just wanted the participants to know that you are available to write in the uh, the chat box any questions that you have in response to the last presentation or even during the next presentation. Those will be going to the organizers, and we can address those during the question and answer period. So thank you, Laurel Firestone, for joining our webinar and adding much expertise. Um, she is the co-director and attorney at law for the Community Water Center. She co-founded and directs the Community Water Center and previously served as the director of the Rural Poverty Water Project at the Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment under the 2004-2006 Equal Justice Works Fellowship. She was awarded the Gary Bellow Public Service Award by Harvard Law School in 2013 and was co-awarded the Carla Bard Advocacy Award from public, uh, public Officials for Water and Environment Reform. With her uh, co-executive director, Suzanne 
D, sorry if I'm not pronouncing this correctly, Andi, in 2010. She authored the Comprehensive Guide for, to Community Drinking Water Advocacy and has served on the Tulare Water um, Commission and co-chaired the Governor's Drinking Water Stakeholder Group. Thank you so much, Laurel, for joining the webinar. Yeah, um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I am hopefully getting these slides. Um, sorry. Um, so yeah, my name is Laurel Firestone, and I have worked with some of the hundreds of communities in the state um, and residents in California that don't have access to safe drinking water every day um, in in their house, in their schools, and in community places. So while 95% of communities in California have safe water from the tap, um, many of the smallest systems in both urban and predominantly rural communities don't have access um, and have to worry every day about how they're going to access safe water in their homes, whether their kids are going to have safe water at school. Um, and the um, and, and over 384 communities and schools um, that are publicly regulated chronically lack access to safe drinking water in California. That number does not count the many households and small systems under 15 connections that are not regulated by the state. Um, so the impacts are even higher. Um, this is a map of the small systems that the originally the California Department of Public Health and the Drinking Water Program is now at the State Water Board um, has mapped that, that chronically lack access to safe drinking water. And as you can see, there are nearly, nearly every county has at least one system. Um, so even though the, this is disproportionately and, and predominantly in areas like the San Joaquin Valley. It's an issue in Southern California as well. Um, and in our analysis, we looked at uh, schools impacted by unsafe drinking water and, and, and preliminarily found that 48 of the 58 counties in the state had at least one school impacted by unsafe tap water. Um, and keep in mind that this map does not include the many small communities and private well owners that are not regulated by the state. So for example, the, the small Polancos in Coachella Valley um, or small mobile home parks under 15 connections that are not regulated as public water systems are not included in this map. So, so there's more systems than even mapped here in, um, that are dealing with these challenges. The most common groundwater contaminants and drinking water contaminants are arsenic and nitrate. Um, and there's been studies, uh, Carolina Balas at UC Berkeley looked at both of these contaminants in the San Joaquin Valley and found that there is a, a disproportionate impact on low-income communities and Latino communities. Um, and there's a real impact in both health and um, the economic security of families dealing with these problems. Many residents have to spend anywhere from 4 to 10 percent of their household income on drinking water alone, and this means they don't have money for other basic needs. We've found that, that many residents are often still consuming contaminated tap water through um, cooking beans or soup. Um, making ice, um, making coffee and things with tap water. Um, and, and because of this high cost, people turn to other sources or, or, or don't consume water. And um, as Dr. Patel talked about, lack of water um, impacts uh, educational outcomes. Um, and, and we also see increased obesity and, and use of sugar sweetened beverage, consumption of sugar sweetened beverages um, that may be even cheaper than bottled water. Um, at the Community Water Center, we see four main components 
to accessing clean, safe, and affordable drinking water. Um, there needs to be, and, and so this just helps you understand why many communities are in the situation they're in of, of chronic uh, lack of access, and that includes dilapidated infrastructure or inadequate infrastructure to begin with. Um, that means, you know, wells that may be not deep enough, that may not be properly constructed, or leaky pipes. Um, institutional capacity, so often the systems are run by volunteers. Um, it's a very small systems, often don't have the technical, managerial, or financial capacity to um, operate and maintain a system um, that can meet safe drinking water standards. And uh, and the source water is, is increasingly contaminated. So our groundwater has become increase, increasingly contaminated in the state. Um, it's very difficult to afford the cost of treatment for very small systems. And so many systems continue to just rely on, on contaminated wells. And really, this uh, fundamentally is a community equity issue. And so the, the, the systems that are most impacted are disadvantaged low-income communities that are already hit in many other ways. Um, and so we at the Community Water Center feel that if, if that, that is really underlying all of these other aspects. And so to really sustainably and, and um, systemically address these challenges, we need to build the power of the communities impacted and ensure that communities impacted are part of the decision making that affects them. We recently um, passed the Human Rights to Water Law in 2012, and so now the state has recognized that all Californians have a basic human right to safe, clean, and affordable drinking water for their basic human needs. Um, unfortunately, today with the drought, that is even harder. And so in addition to the, the four challenges that we talked about before, we're now seeing more and more uh, wells going dry. The first ones to go dry have really been the individual private wells, since those tend to be much shallower. Um, but many water systems have seen their wells go offline and, and their capacity drastically declining. Um, and over $20 million in emergency funding um, was put out last year to help address emergency needs for those systems. This is a map from the, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research that looked at known private well or, or known dry well, dry water supply wells. Um, this is certainly not a, a exhaustive map and, and you can see most of them are in the San Joaquin Valley but there are some going down into Southern California, and, and this also has to do with who's, with who's reporting, and there's just been a much bigger effort to do outreach in much of the San Joaquin Valley. So I, I would say as the drought increases, we will unfortunately see these red dots grow. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about those issues in the question and answer if, if people want to talk more. Um, the safe water, so we, <laughs> Safe water access points um, through the Agua for All initiative is something that we've been able to be a part of. Um, the California Endowment launched, launched the Agua for All initiative um, as a pilot and with in partnership with the organizations. RCAC is, is really the lead um, in implementing this project. Community Water Center, us, we're based in um, the San Joaquin Valley and have been the local partner for the South Kern area, which is one of the main areas and Pueblo Unido has been the lead uh, local partner um, for implementation in the Eastern Coachella Valley. Um, together, we're installing 120 access points um, in, in both Coachella and uh, Arvin and Lamont and South Kern. Um, the, the, overall, the program works to raise awareness of the drinking water challenges and um, how communities can access water both immediately and um, how to and accelerating the long-term solutions we 
build local partnerships to install safe taps in schools and community places. Um, and we're in the process right now of looking at expanding beyond those two communities to um, further throughout the state. Uh, I would say that in South Kern, we had most of the community water systems didn't have safe drinking water at the tap. And so in addition to an access point, we had to put in a point of use filtration system with each access point that needed to be a certified certified for arsenic removal, which is the contaminant in that area. And that adds a lot of expense, a lot of complication in terms of operations and maintenance. Um, but I think it is really exciting and that we're learning a lot about what is possible and, and can facilitate the expansion of these where needed um, in other parts of the state. The, the point of use filtration systems in Arvin were funded with a, as a pilot with a grant with the state actually to, um, to look at point of use uh, filtration systems for arsenic and um, learn from the process to help and in, uh, inform broader use of that kind of technology, both for, for schools and, and these sorts of access points, but also um, potentially for, for, for even residential use. Um, I'll talk a little bit, and, and maybe we can spend more time um, in the question and answers on funding sources to address these issues. So uh, I would group the types of funding sources that are available into three categories. There's long-term drinking water solution funding, which is really funding capital costs of uh, drilling new wells, putting in new pipelines, um, fixing leaky pipes, and putting in treatment plants. Uh, all of that can be funded under the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, which is about 80 to $85 million a year that is uh, administered through the state water board now. And the new Proposition 1 funding, which is going to become available later this year, um, which is $250 million uh, for small disadvantaged communities under 3,300 connections. Uh, it's primarily, the, the Proposition 1 funding is primarily through grants and the state uh, revolving fund has a combination of grants and loans depending on eligibility and the size of your system and ability to pay. Um, there's also interim and emergency solution funding for the first time. This really is new and started last year. Um, this is really flexible. Um, funding that, that this is the funding that was used to help fund the filtration systems in Arvin with the Agua for All pilot. Uh, right now there's 19 million uh, in new money available for, for disadvantaged communities um, to address uh, interim water supplies as well as water system repairs. So it can cover O&M, it can cover things like um, the cost of maintaining this, the filtration systems or delivering bottled water, um, and there's a, a also broad eligibility for who can, can uh, apply for this funding, including really all public, all local public agencies, um, community drinking water systems, non-for-profits, and tribal governments are all eligible. Uh, and then the third area of funding is uh, schools facilities funding. So uh, what we found with, as we're, installing these in many, particularly in schools, is there's often um, major plumbing and, and facilities and installation issues that have to be addressed in order to get access points in. Um, and that's, you know, not alone in schools. We've also found that to be a major problem in parks, for example, where we're putting some of these access points in. And um, one, there's a couple of funding sources that are specific to schools that we wanted to call out. One is the local control action plan. So the, um, you know, there's, there's luckily more funding coming down, particularly for disadvantaged schools. And the action plans that are, that are developed by the, the school district community um, or the school community has different, is able to prioritize how that money is spent. 
And the first priority area that, that those plans are supposed to look at includes ensuring that facilities are in good repair. Um, so that funding that's coming to schools and especially is, is supposed to be increasing in the low income system, in the low income schools, um, that money, if, if the parents and school community is, is putting that in the local control action plans, addressing, you know, water access in schools can be built into that funding, especially for things like putting in a, a, a tap or addressing um, fountains that don't work. And then obviously individual school bonds um, is a potential source and not an easy one, but where they have been passed and, are, and, and, and fit into what they were passed for, um, it's something to, to be looking at, especially if you're building new facilities. Um, make, making sure that there's water access points there is important. And I wanted to mention a couple current legislative opportunities. So there's two bills making their way through the legislature right now, AB 496 and SB 334. Um, both of them are trying to uh, improve water access in schools and ensure that there's funding and also address some of the issues around uh, testing, particularly for lead, and, um, and notification of whether water is safe or not. And uh, right, you know, I think as this webinar is happening, there may be an announcement by the governor on a budget deal. Um, so I'm not sure if this made it in or not, but one of the things is um, that was being discussed in the budget was a trailer bill look, trying to do two things. Um, one is put put in five million for installation of drinking water stations and filtration systems in public schools throughout the state. Um, and the second was to uh, put money towards developing and improving tracking systems for schools, daycares, and communities without access to safe, clean, and affordable, and accessible water. Um, but one of the things we really found is, and, and is gonna be key for spending the money well that we have with the water bond, um, is that we need to identify where the problems are. And unfortunately, our state hasn't uh, developed really adequate tracking and evaluation systems to have a, a really good picture of who has access to safe drinking water and who doesn't, um, particularly with schools. And so that's something we're trying to um, get, that we've been trying to get in, in the trailer bill with the budget and we'll see whether it gets in or not. Um, if it doesn't, we're hoping it will, that this will, uh, might be able to make it into one of these two bills. Um, and I would say, especially on the legislative opportunities, if anyone has any questions, uh, please. Oh, no. Great. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think I'm okay. My, I I think I've lost control of the um, of the slides, which I'm pretty much done. So I just wanted to okay. say, if you can hear me, um, I'll let somebody else take over with the slides. But um, especially on the legislative opportunities, if um, if there's any questions or follow up, I would love to, you know, please contact me directly, and would love to follow up with the group as well. And I great, think thank you so much, Laurel. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you again um, to both of our speakers. That was really enlightening. This is uh, Katie Momin. I'm the Water Initiative Coordinator at the Public Health Alliance and um, would love to move us into a brief question and answer period and then really a, a discussion. Um, I would love for all the participants on the call to um, feel free and I encourage you to raise your hand. Uh, we'd love to get a conversation going. Um, we encourage you to raise your hand and I can bring you into a conversation. Uh, and we really want to focus that discussion around, you know, what what we can do um, as advocates in nutrition, advocates of nutrition and healthy food systems. Where might some opportunities be for us to get involved? So, you know, we'd really love to hear from you if these presentations spark new thoughts about about your role about the opportunities within, you know, the NEOP work plans or community nutrition action plans to engage um, on these issues. And there's one comment uh, here in the questions box thanking Laurel for uh, listing the funding sources. 
Um, so that was really helpful. I'm going to unmute both of our panelists at this point. Um, and I'm also going to make Gail and Naomi and Holly uh, all available to speak. So feel free to chime in anytime here as you see fit. Um, and there are no other questions from the audience, but I would just love to ask a question um, myself, then we can move into the discussion. Um, Laurel, you, you mentioned um, the, the drinking water funding sources, um, both long-term interim solutions as well as funding at specific to school facilities. I'm just curious if you see a particular role for nutrition advocates, um, you know, based within county, the county health department or other places to engage on these issues. I mean, do you, do you see that um, departments would be one of the main applicants for funding and orchestrators of trying to get more water in schools? Um, maybe you or Anisha could speak to that. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great, yeah, this is Laurel. Um, definitely, so I think in particular on the interim and emergency solutions where you are um, in counties with systems and schools that are having either water quality or water supply challenges, um, which you know I know that there's a number in, for example, in Riverside County, um, and like I said, nearly every county has at least some very small system that is having trouble accessing safe drinking water. Um, counties and, and counties are really the best ones to apply and be the direct applicant for um, funding to provide drinking water and that can go, they can then grant that directly to schools or to nonprofits um, or, or provide it themselves. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a really, I think a, a really important role for counties and nonprofits that are working in this area either to, to step up to do it themselves or work with their local partners to ensure that somebody is applying and accessing those resources and getting it to the systems that need it. Um, and then I would say another really important role is with the local control action plans and, I, um, and, and really trying to provide information um, to local partners um, around and people developing school wellness policies and making sure that this that that they're inventorying the need um, in their school and ensuring that the facilities in good repair um, discussions in the local control action plans are looking at at water access and you know mm -hmm. are fountains working um, is there the ability to access water at um, lunch and recess and you know and in, in, in high traffic areas um, and putting that in to as, as a priority um, as much as possible I think mm. just means that that otherwise it, it really gets left out yeah great well thank you um, what about you Anisha Patel what do you um, what do you see as maybe the top uh, leverage points or ways that nutrition leaders can get involved to support increasing the consumption and access to safe water in schools and other community places. Where's the biggest bang for yeah, our buck there? There are um, actually models and others in districts that have done really great work um, in this area. So for example, um, Project Lean has worked with urban school district to get really strong language in the school wellness policy. When we examined school district wellness policies across the state, we found very little language and a national examination of school district wellness policies also found very mm -hmm. little language about water. So I do think that that's um, definitely an area um, where nutrition um, and public health um, organizations can get involved um, in those local um, school district wellness policies. Um, another um, thing to think about are going to, in addition to these other funding sources, are if you need you know, smaller resources, um, going to local industry partners, perhaps, or the water district or the public health department or groups like First Five to see if they have any funding that could be used to help support um, water promotion or access efforts. So um, to give you an example, in Santa Clara County, California, in the San Jose area, they've installed, um, you know, about 60 um, reusable water bottle filling stations in schools and other community locations, and it's been a partnership of 
the public health department, the water district, and also first five. And so they've really, you know, done a great job. And then Britta also, um, through mission readiness, has granted hydration stations to other um, schools um, throughout California as well. So I think there are local um, opportunities for approaching funders um, potentially or water districts because they want to promote tap water in the places that it's safe. Um, in areas that it's unsafe, of course, um, you know, looking towards long, more long-term or interim solutions um, definitely is needed. Great. Thanks. And one of our participants is asking a question. Um, our CNAP group in Imperial County is looking into funding to provide water filling at fountain stations in one of our regional parks. Would either of you panelists recommend looking into Prop 1 to support that kind of an effort? Right now, this is Laurel, right now Prop 1 as defined at least the drinking water portion um, is limited to systems that uh, don't have access to safe water. So it's more about addressing the, the safety and the systems issue than, um, than, access, and, than access points. Um, so I think mm -hmm. that the it's really it's going to be I think you're mostly going to be looking at at other sources for that than Prop One unless there's other chapters of Prop One. Um, I will say you know what this is not an easy one either, but there are other part chapters of Part One for uh, Prop One, sorry, um, that include for example the Integrated Regional Water Management Plans. Um, and those mm -hmm. are projects that can be brought forward as as a region. Um, to address water issues regionally. Um, and I know in the Coachella Valley, one of the projects from their integrated regional water management plan was a project to install uh, point of use filters in many of the mobile home parks and small Polanco communities that didn't have access to safe water. So I think what those water access points in parks and public places, if it's a priority in your region, could definitely fit into that that integrated regional water management plan funding source but uh, it, it requires being a priority regionally and working with with your local mm -hmm. IRWM system uh, that's a really good point Laurel and we can also send out um, as part of our resources after the call uh, a link to the integrated regional water management planning um, pages so people can find where their local groups are um, and there, I have an, another question here for Anisha Patel, and we just have a few minutes left in our question period. Um, and I just want to encourage uh, our, our participants to feel free to write in or raise your hand and let us know what you're doing in this area that other people might want to think about in their counties, um, or if you have any ideas or questions about action um, that could be taken, that would be great. So. Uh, meanwhile, a question for Dr. Patel, which is a specific question about the school-based research project, uh, which is coming in from one of our participants. Did you consider, um, or maybe this was used, including washable plastic cups with the student's lunch trays to encourage water consumption? This might not have been feasible if the school cafeterias were not already relying on reusable plastic trays. Yes, um, that actually was the case. Um, in the schools we were working with, they were outsourcing. A lot of their food was made off campus and brought in, so they didn't have a lot of infrastructure for cleaning. A lot of um, um, products, so like for example, the trays were all either compostable or recyclable trays. They weren't reused trays, but that has come up as a possibility um, in schools that do have that infrastructure, so you're not creating excessive waste um, from these cups. Thanks for bringing that up as a possibility. This is Gail. I just wanted to mention that this has been really fabulous and I wanted to say we were so fortunate to have funding to do Rethink Your Drink and work in the Coachella Valley where Agua for All has been involved. And what out of that, our, our, our grant, we were able to adopt as a county and working with facilities is to say for every water um, drinking fountain that needs to be replaced, or a new one needs to go into a new building, it will be um, the refillable hydration stations. So that's a very simple policy that can make a difference among many, many people. 
great. Gail, can we get can you share that policy language with the group? Uh, I will not I don't have it not off the top of my hands, but I will get mm -hmm. I will put it through with the group. And the other thing that we le a lesson we learned very much was um, we incorporated the state messages of Rethink Your Drink that is being done in WIC, is being done in the NEOP program, and also Potter the Otter, and utilizing those messages. And mission readiness has been with every 15 hydration stations that we have implemented throughout the Coachella Valley. But you know, really putting those together and those messages and those so that people hear it over and over and over again really, really helps from child care all the way to parks and rec. That's great, Gail, and we, we would love to help get that policy language out so other people can see see it up close and personal. Um, that would be really wonderful. And just one last question before um, we wrap up here. Um, Laurel, I have a question for you. You mentioned a couple of bills that are in progress, AB 496 and SB 334. Um, are, are 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 you looking for um, additional support or for people to weigh in on that from uh, the nutrition community? Yes. Are there definitely. any kind of specific actions that people can take at the state policy level? I know that's probably not the you know foot forward of most of the people on this call, but you know, are there is there some low hanging fruit there? Yeah, it would be great to have support for both of those bills, um, and we're hoping you know whether this uh, gets into the trailer bill or not if it doesn't I think we're hoping it will get uh, put into these one of one or both of these bills um, so yes we would love support for both um, uh, the more broad based support we can have the better and um, it'd be great to have that either from individuals um, individual counties or agencies or organizations or you know I don't know what the uh, is appropriate from the Alliance or different committees mm. Um, that would be really wonderful. Okay, great. Well, Nate, I think that after this call, we'd love to summarize some of these opportunities and pull together the resources, and we'll be sending those out um, as soon as we can to all the participants on this call. Um, and, and really interested in keeping the conversation going, and just excited about the opportunity to build more connection between the nutrition and food systems communities and um, folks like yourselves. Uh, Anisha and Laurel, who are doing great work out in the field and research, um, just building more bridges there. That's wonderful. And with that, I'll just turn it over to Naomi Billups to, to close up the session today. Great. Thanks, Katie. I just want to um, extend another thank you, big thank you to the panelists today. Um, your uh, expertise and, and lessons learned and recommendations are great, greatly valued. Um, and we look forward to continuing to work on this issue as a public health alliance. So um, anyway, I just want to say thank you also to Holly and Katie um, and my co-chair, Gail. Thanks. Great. And um, Naomi, do you want to just maybe mention some of the upcoming webinars? And Holly, I think we have a slide on that yes. too. Yes. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Okay, so um, I wanted to extend, again, the opportunity to continue to participate in the rest of the series for this uh, webinar, and in a minute you'll also see that there's two other tracks um, available, and some of your colleagues or yourself might be interested in participating in those as well. Um, as you, oh, there you go. Um, okay, so that's our nutrition track. And so we have, oh, okay. <laughs> and then we also have a track that's really specific to environmental health. So um, please get the word out to your colleagues. There's, you know, multi-pronged approaches to dealing with the water crisis, and each and every one of us has a role to play. Um, and then also for public health leaders. So that would be like your public health officer, um, your agency directors, even you know some of your electeds. So. Um, get the word out, and we look forward to continuing to participate in, in the nutrition series and um, look forward to actually coming up with strategic directions to work on together.